Welcome to the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast, where we hear stories from everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Happy Sunday here aboard Old Mighty Sparrow. One old man aboard one old boat. <laughs> Classic. Um, so, I, you know, I, I have a couple of sort of saved podcasts that I'll be putting out in due time, and I also have a couple of new people that I've run into here at the marina that have expressed some interest in sitting down with me, and um, so we've we've got some uh, good stuff coming, hopefully this week, uh, into the, the next week and stuff, but I kind of needed to sit down and plot and plan a little bit because at the end of this month or sometime in the beginning of May, I need to set sail from South Carolina down here in Buford and head offshore and make my way up to Maine. And normally I wait until June 1st to do this trip, but this time there's a little bit of a shortage of manpower where I work up there in uh, Maine, and I need to try to get up there a little bit earlier, like mid-May. So I'm uh, I'm gonna try to get everything sorted out and and fixed and ready to go so that I can set sail as early as maybe May first. That's what I'm, I think that's sort of the game plan. You know, I, I've kind of found that one of the things that helps me actually be ready on the day I need to go is to make my departure about a week before I actually need to go. And that way I get this little buffer. But I actually really. I try to sort of forget that and just choose that day. So I'm choosing sort of May 1st to try and set sail. And if all goes well, then the boat will be ready. And if the weather is bad or it doesn't seem like I need to be up there quite that early, then, hey, I've got a prepared boat and uh, I can just kick back, relax, and have some fun for the last week down here. Before I get up to ice-cold, foggy old Maine. Mm -mm. So, with that being said, uh, essentially, I'm doing what I always do before any trip, uh, no matter how big or small. And uh, this one, I wouldn't call this a small trip just because it's on the East Coast early enough in the spring that the systems coming off of Hatteras and off the off New England and stuff can still be pretty hairy. Uh, I don't know if, um, I, I think I talked about that book, A Storm Too Soon. Those guys got hit by a massive bomb, uh, and I believe that was in May 2007 <clears throat> or 2011, I can't really remember, but in any event, 60, 80-foot waves caught in an eddy in the Gulf Stream. They were only a couple hundred miles off the coast of Hatteras, and that's essentially, well, I won't be that far off Hatteras because I like to stay in the stream, but you get where I'm going with this. It can be pretty hairy. You can run into some pretty severe weather going up, and because I'm doing this solo, I have to be, or I like to be offshore away from traffic so I can sleep and uh, that affords me that, but it also puts me in a position where bad weather comes rolling off the coast as fast as it develops. Uh, you can find yourself in a pretty hairy position, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. And uh, sometimes you just got to get out there and go for it. I mean, I'll, I'll obviously be looking for a good weather window, but um, as far as forecasts on the East Coast... Offshore go, I would say you maybe get three, possibly four days out of a forecast before everything flip-flops and changes. So if I get that, great. Um, 
You know, I remember two years ago setting sail uh, with my buddy Bo Jangles from the AT, and uh, we had one of the best rocket ship rides I've ever ever experienced. And then uh, I think it was the year before that. I don't know. I've done it. I've done it enough times now where I can't really remember which year was which, but. Um, I've done it in as little as eight and a half days, and it's also taken as much as 12 days to get up there, depending. Uh, I remember coming down from Maine to Charleston and got caught in a pretty severe gale. Well, yeah, I guess I guess, I guess, guess you could call it that. Um, and I had to hove to for three days and ended up east of Bermuda. <laughs> So I should have left Maine and been able to just sort of cruise straight south and then cut in, but I ended up way, way out there. Um, so you never know what's going to happen. Thus, the planning. Um, but I figured I would sit down and and sort of go through my list in real time here on the podcast just to give uh, give everybody an example of what um, what I sort of. How I do it, I guess. I don't know. I yeah, that's that's basically it. So uh, essentially, I'm sitting here uh, under my cool little light, which is very reminiscent of the pathway lights at the bitter end back in the day, and it's shining this beautiful halogen glow down here. Uh, but I just have a spiral notebook and a pen, and I have a few points on here, but I I typically work my way through and just sort of list things that need to be done, things that I'm going to need to prepare for, and check off things that are all set and done already that I know are good, that I'm, I'm pretty much clear and, and in the clear for. Because, you know, with, with essentially three, four weeks left until departure, um, this is really the time to start putting together that list and having it plastered right there uh, at the nav station, always being glanced at, always being looked over, and always hopefully being checked off as we go. And this will definitely be sort of the master list uh, as far as this stuff goes because a little little update on the old phone. Um, It it really is important because you you can't just keep this stuff in your head. You'll always forget stuff, and uh, that's why I want to sort of go through it. So first and foremost, number one on the list is engine and battery systems. And um, as far as the engine goes, I know that um, in in stock as far as spares, so I'm writing down spares, uh, I've got plenty of impellers. Uh, I believe I have four on board. Always like to keep a few of those. I need uh, let's see, I'm going to do got or have, and I'm going to need need over here. So I'm essentially looking at two lists, things that I have and things that I need. Um, I'm going to need oil uh, to make sure, just regular motor oil, so that I can do at least, I'd like to be able to always do two oil changes if I need to, because I know I've had the problem of taking water in through the exhaust, although that's one of the projects that I need to do. And I actually, I went in, so there's, on the exhaust system, as it goes through the through hull, and the exhaust goes out the boat, typically if we're rolling in heavy seas for long periods of time, uh, I think what's happening is essentially I'm scooping water up, it rolls to the other direction. It's now the high side and it dumps it back and it just keeps doing that over and over again until it finally makes its way into the engine. And I have an anti-siphon, um, sort of thing in there. I don't even know what the technical term is for that, but, uh, it, I think when this boat rolls, it rolls so violently sometimes in, in certain weather conditions that it overcomes that anti-siphon. There's just too much coming in. So, uh, in any event, the valve, I went to go and work it a little bit, and the actual handle just pretty much is rusted out. And uh, so the handle just bent, and the valve stayed open. So that's one need is uh, the valve valve handle. That's a little project that needs to be done. So I need to get some oil. 
couple gallons of that. I need uh, to fix that, uh, fix the, the handle on the the valve. And then um, as far as oil filters and fuel filters, I have plenty of those. I have three more fuel filters and two oil filters, so I should be good. I'm going to write that down. So filters are okay. So those go in that list, which is nice. Um, and then other stuff, really, I have I have a couple of quarts of transmission fluid, so that's pretty good. I've got a gallon of um, coolant, uh, so that's good. And then I have a bunch of distilled water for the batteries, which is all good. So all those will go back onto the I already have them list. So those are good. Um, other than that, with the actual engine, I don't think there's too much else that I really need to have for a trip this size. Um, Mighty Sparrow's pretty well equipped with some of the big backups and big spares as far as I have a spare alternator and a spare starter. Normally, I wouldn't think of those as something you would need for just a trip off the coast unless you wanted to be super prepared. Um, it's nice to have, but it's it's definitely, um, I don't know, it's the nice part about a sailboat, you know, if the engine fails on you, you've got the sails, which are the actual main engine. The engine's just an auxiliary. Mm. But when it comes to the battery system, now we've got a problem because I have not replaced all these batteries and I have... The house battery bank is four 12 volts, uh, just regular deep, deep cycle lead acid batteries. And then I have one for the engine. So a total of five batteries and they are all really, really whipped. So they are not holding on to much of a charge. And, um, that's definitely going to be a problem when I got offshore. So all the batteries need to be replaced. Um, unless for whatever reason, uh, I can't <laughs> afford to replace all of them, which I'm going to have to try and figure out a way to do that because it's not like you can replace half the batteries and then you're good. Um, I guess if I wanted to really limit myself, I could not use the refrigerator on this trip and just eat canned food and stuff like that. Um, and then I could probably get away with just switching out the engine battery and maybe two house batteries, but, uh, I'll figure out a way to get a little quiche to, uh, to get that. That's the nice part about lead acid batteries is they're not that expensive. Plus typically wherever you take them, uh, you're going to get a little bit of a rebate because you drop off the old ones. Um, and that, that sort of helps you out a little bit. So hopefully we'll be able to just replace all those and we'll be in good working shape. Um, as far as the solar panels, those are both working really well. I tested those the other day and I ordered a new charge controller. So now I'll have two backups um, in place of the one that's actually working right now. So as far as the engine, the batteries, and electrical generation through the solar panels, we are pretty good. Just a couple of things to buy. Oil, fix the handle, new batteries, and I should be pretty much set to jet uh, as far as that, that part of it goes. And again, with this voyage, uh, one of the things that I'm thinking of doing, and I haven't made up my mind 100% on it yet, but... I wouldn't mind doing sort of an old school trip in in some respect as far as like the navigation goes and whipping out the old sextant and trying to navigate my way right up to, if not all the way to Rockland, uh, at least up to probably George's Bank uh, or thereabouts off of Cape Cod and do that with just the sextant. You know, that that's like a week long section of the trip and... I don't know. It might be kind of cool. Give me a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a challenge as far as really keeping in tune with what's going on in the sun and all that sort of stuff. Now, granted, I could take off and it could be cloudy for days on end, and then I'm already sort of out of luck in a lot of respects. But at the same time, it could be pretty nice. Usually, it's kind of sunny down here. Uh, once you get up to Maine, it gets a little bit different, but. 
who knows? You never know. So that's that's sort of something to to think about. Um, so as far as engine, batteries, power supply, I got a few things to pick up and one little project. But other than that, we're we're pretty well set uh, as far as all that sort of stuff goes. And I was able to get the engine running after its little hibernation while I was in Michigan. Definitely super important, always making sure, you know, once you get back to the boat, run the engine, check the oil, check all the the fluids and stuff. And she ran great once I got her started. And, um, yeah, she she actually ran really well. I ran her for a good hour or two and uh, brought the old RPMs up to about 2,000, which for this boat, it's it's a a 50-horsepower 4108, like an old Perkins. And normally... To get this boat up to hull speed, I want to say it's about a thousand RPMs. So there's not a whole lot of reason to ever run it much higher than that, except that I know in, in a lot of the books that I've read, you know, one of the problems people have is if you don't run your engine so that it really heats up, you can get all sorts of, you get this sort of sludge coming up. Um, when you pull the oil cap off, it's like a gelatinous, whitish sort of thing. And I don't know. So I've I've heard that um, you know you run it, you run it good, and get those RPMs up. So she really heats up and burns all that stuff off. And when I pulled the cap off, everything looked pretty good. So check check on that. Uh, as long as I can get that that valve on the exhaust working, because I what I'm going to try and do is rig up a little bit of a pulley rope system so that I can just. I, I, I on this boat you got to pull the stairs the companionway stairs out and then you got to crawl all the way over the engine which typically you're doing this when the engine's hot which is not fun and then all the way in the very very back uh right in the stern and you go and have to go in there and close that valve and it's usually pretty hard so what I was going to do is rig up a little pulley system so that I can actually do it from the companionway and just pull one line to close the valve pull another line to open the valve and hopefully that will sort out that issue and it won't take on any water and the engine will be beautiful but uh yeah so that's it for that little section and then the next probably most important one is sales and sales are kind of a pain in my neck um i wish i would have really kept a better log when I was out on this last voyage of any little issues that were coming up. Um, I think because I didn't do that, I am going to probably have to take out the sails and inspect them all, like lay them all out on the lawn, take a look over them, find any issues I can, fix all of them, and then put them back on the boat. Now, I, I definitely did a lot of repairs when I was out at sea last time. Um, I'm planning on just using the the heavy weather mainsail. Uh, the staysail I know needs a little bit of attention here and there. But it's sort of the lighter wind sails that I really want to focus on. The two drifters and make sure those are okay. They're Typically it's going to be a pretty easy fix. I like to just use sticky tape and then do a little bit of sewing around that so it doesn't creep. But uh, so I'm going to do that in the need section of uh, inspect sales. So that's going to that's going to be a project that takes at least a day. So that's that's one of those things you sort of have to keep in mind when you're coming up with these lists, because it's not like you're going to leave that for the day before you you take off. You want to make sure you find some serious problems. I mean, again, this voyage is is probably going to take between 10 and 14 days depending on the weather. But you want to make sure you don't have to, if you can do it on land, it's going to be way easier than doing it out at sea. Uh, Other than that, the inventory for sales is pretty good. I still have a ton of them Uh, right now on board. I have two main sales, one heavy weather, one light weather. Um, I've got two staysails, two storm jibs, I do have no. I got rid of the tri sail because it's just ridiculous, and uh, there was no reason to have it. 
because the heavy weather mainsail has three reefs, which when you put that third reef in, it's smaller than a laser mainsail. So that's pretty tiny. Um, and then I have two drifters. I have three different jibs and then I've got a spinnaker. So that's a decent amount of sails. And again, they're all Hank on. So one goes up. If I need to do another one, there's no furlers or anything like that. Everything's super, super simple and very labor intensive. Uh, you know, the only times I really think about getting a furler on this boat is at three in the morning when I have to go up there <laughs> and and pull down one of the drifters because it's getting a bit windy and now I'm completely soaked with salt water uh, and exhausted again. <laughs> Good time sell, you know. The only thing is those Hankons, man, they rarely ever fail. That is one thing I do have to inspect uh, is the Hankons, especially on the old Drifter because I know those were getting pretty thin. I've got quite a few, and there's a sailmaker here at the uh, at the marina, so I can get parts and all that sort of stuff. So pretty much with the sails, it's just inspecting and then repairing. So that's something that can be done on any nice day. And luckily, I do have a Sailrite sewing machine here, so I can do all that stuff myself. Uh, as far as rigging goes, there's not a whole lot uh, that I think I need to do at this point because I did so much before this last trip, and we really... You know, we went through some pretty heavy weather for sure, uh, especially going through Wanda and stuff, but we didn't take a serious beating for a very, very extended, like months and months. It's not like we were going through the Southern Ocean. Um, so I think there isn't any rigging, running, or standing that really needs uh, any big attention, but there will be a full inspection of the rigging. Um, I do know that I need to tape the uh, the spreader boots up there. So I'm going to write that down, spreader boots. Because there is nothing more annoying than seeing the electrical tape streaming off of these these little covers that go at the end of the uh, the spreaders. And you're just watching it sort of unwind and you're thinking to yourself, geez, I wish I would have gone when I was on the dock up in the bosun's chair and done that. Uh, as far as the electrical system, uh, I guess this, this sort of tunes in, but all the lights work, the nav lights work. I have yet to put the bow sprit back on. I'm still doing the varnish projects on that, but uh, I will check because there's, there's essentially two sets of navigation lights on Sparrow. We've got the tricolor up top, which shines, you know, red and green and white in the back. That's at the very top of the mast. But then there's a secondary set uh, on the deck. And I actually use the ones on the deck when I'm, if I have to motor up these rivers or if I'm in um, pretty heavy fog, because those are LED, super bright. Uh, if I'm in anywhere where there's fishing boats, lobster boats, and it's nighttime, I like to use those because I think those guys are looking more for those sort of lights rather than, uh, you know, looking way up in the air for some tiny little, tiny little tricolor up there. But all of, uh, the other lights are working right now. Spreader lights work. Uh, everything is, is pretty much a go at this point. So, so that's already been checked off. Uh, as far as electronics go, uh, the GPS plotter that i have on here that's i don't know 20 years old or whatever that still works there is a vhf on it but that doesn't work anymore so that that thing is pretty much 100 percent useless at this point except it does spit out your gps coordinates so if that's still working then it's a valuable navigation aid um but as far as the vhf and the standalone ais those are both working and working well um, I do have a little bit of an issue with the GPS antenna for the AIS. It broke the wire, and I've had to replace that. I had to replace that out at sea. So I'm definitely going to look into getting a spare for a spare GPS aerial uh, for the AIS. And just to see, because, you know... 
those connections, those wires are so tiny. And unfortunately, where the break was, was on the deck. So it was one of those things where you had to use all these little butt connectors, get it all connected up, and then put it in a whole bunch of shrink wrap and then shrink all that up and then tape it and then tape it again and then try and keep it sort of elevated. I don't know. The C will always find a way in. So I don't know how long it's going to last. I know I have plenty of butt connectors and things like that so I can repair it again if needed, but um, it'd be ideal if if I could actually just replace that aerial system because the GPS aerial doesn't cost too much for an AIS uh, and I have a spare one on here, but it does not have the correct hookups for that exact system. So found that one out the hard way. You know, always, that's one of the crazy things. You you order these these bits and bobs and things that are supposed to sort of work together and all that. And unless you actually physically hook them up and prove to yourself that without a shadow of a doubt they're actually working, then... You never actually know. <laughs> as 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 obvious as that sounds, I mean, I set sail last time with that, and when I first had the problem with the uh, the AIS out in the Atlantic, I went and I said, "Oh, well, I'll just hook up the spare, you know, blah blah blah," and then I'll figure this one out. And I couldn't hook it up, and I was just thinking about how stupid I was. So, word to the wise: learn from my mistakes. Hmm. Uh, but I do have. I've got all the charts that I need to get out of Buford, and then I have all the charts that I need to get through all the outer islands and all that sort of stuff in Maine. I've got both paper and I've got them on um, an iPhone and then on an iPad as well, on iNav or whatever it is, or XNav, I, I can't remember. So plenty of backups as far as navigation stuff goes. And uh, and then, obviously, I have the old bare bones stuff, the sextant, hand-bearing compass, blah, blah, blah. Because you got to have that stuff. I mean, I, I'm constantly, constantly doing paper charts and, and fixes and things like that because that's your true backup. You lose that electricity, and then you're done. And I, I, I guess I should make a note. I do have a full backup for... Uh, all the electrical, and that's one of those Goal Zero power packs uh, with two little solar panels to charge it. So if everything goes just completely pear-shaped out there, I can at least, bare minimum, still still be able to charge um, my phone, uh, my, my sat phone, I mean, and then charge, you know, a little phone or a computer to be able to either download weather or to be able to uh, see see sort of the navigation stuff if it's like a total blackout nightmare situation um so there are backups upon backups upon backups and again you know i i don't know it'd be kind of interesting to think if if i was just setting sail on this smaller trip up the coast if i would need to have all of this stuff or if i could sort of wing it I guess, well, you know what, if I think back to the trip, you know, some of the first trips, when I sailed from the Caribbean up to Gloucester back in 2017 before the big trip, boy, I didn't have a lot of this stuff. I barely had any, I didn't have spare parts for the engine uh, as far as, you know, alternator and, and starter did not have a, a goal zero sort of stuff. <laughs> there was a lot missing. I definitely still had a sextant, though. That's for sure. Okay. Don't want to get lost too much in the weeds. Got to keep keep plugging away on this. Um, as far as projects go on the boat, incomplete projects, uh, it's really just it's the bowsprit. The bowsprit is the main one. It's in pieces right now, but I'm on to the third coat of varnish. And uh, I think once I get to about 10 coats, then I will be putting it all back together and putting it on the boat. So I'm estimating probably two weeks to, yeah, right around two weeks or so, I should be ready to put it all together in the shop and then bring it down and install it on the boat. So that that's the big project. So bow sprit. Um, 
other than that, there isn't too much project wise that needs to be done on this boat because I haven't really I haven't really morphed it into full on just live aboard at the dock mode. It's sort of just has stayed. I do need to um I will need to true the mast. Obviously, once the bow sprit's back on, so that's that's basically going through all the rigging, tensioning the rig, making sure everything's all good, which is kind of nice that I'm in the water. Um, you know, you can't really do it when you're on the hard because the boat's not really 100% in the shape it will be once it hits the water. But um, so I'll be able to do that here on the dock. So I gotta put the bow sprit on, then I can true the mast, get everything ready, and. I guess the one other project I didn't really think of is I need to clean the bottom, which because I got my buddy Chris from episode, I don't know, back in like the 30s or 40s of this show, I had Chris on here and he has a little shop that does bottom cleaning. Not that I'm going to actually ask him to do it, but uh, I'm going to ask him to borrow his hookah so that I can do it, get covered in shrimps, get bitten up, uh, hopefully not get uh hopefully it won't be too bad and change the zincs gotta throw that on there zinc <clears throat> and actually i probably have to change the zinc I'm, i think i'm gonna try and do that tomorrow it's supposed to get pretty warm <clears throat> it got cold here south carolina oh my gosh i last night i think it got in the 40s it was crazy i was like shivering up there i had to turn the heater on i thought those days were gone And I think they are now because it still feels like it's in the uh, high 60s and it's nighttime now. So I think we're doing all right. So that's that's pretty much projects. Um, Bow sprit, true the mast, clean the bottom, change the zinc. Uh, That's about all there really is as far as the big stuff. And again, you know, kind of the nice part about creating this list uh, is that I'm basically always going to be modifying, changing, and updating this thing. Uh, so the one that I'm writing right now is literally going to be the one that is going to be on this nav station until I actually take off, that I'm just going to be crossing things off and adding things to and all that sort of stuff. I can't, I don't know, I can't stress it enough how important it is to actually write this stuff down and have it right in front of your face. So, <clears throat> Uh, self-steering, AKA Mongo. Mongo is doing all right, but it needs a full look over. That's for sure. So I'm going to write inspection. I really would love, there's, there's two bushings, little plastic bushings that are pretty worn out, not all the way through, but enough that the when the hydro blade, the blade that's in the water switches from one side to the other, it, it kind of has this back and forth motion, like a knocking motion, which can be a little annoying and it's definitely not good for it. I mean, with, with an Aries, the only maintenance that you really do besides looking at it is every day you want to just hit it with a couple drops of oil and all these certain little areas. So the whole thing, nothing's actually wearing out. It's just, it's fully lubricated and, um, no matter how much you do that, sometimes you lubricate it and then it's getting hit by breaking waves for the rest of the day and that gets all cleared out. But I've put about 60,000 miles or so on Mongo. So the only problem is to get those bushings replaced, I need to pull the entire hydro blade off. And that is not something I'm willing to do while the boat is in the water. No matter how careful you can be, I mean, we're talking, you know, you got to use a big torch to heat the thing up and then you got to hammer out this big pin and then uh, the whole thing like falls apart. And that's not something I want to do over the water because all those parts are so, they're my precious. So I don't want to uh, lose any of them. And other than that, I mean, Mongo's in great working order. It still works just fine. It just needs... It needs those bushings replaced, but I can I can make it uh, up this trip no problem. Uh, so she's in good working, or he's in good working order. Um, uh, let's see. So self steering is pretty good, and I've got plenty of oil. So I'm gonna put oil in the done. And I use that uh, that three in one 
oil. It comes in these little, great little containers. Um, or, yeah, yeah. It comes in these little containers. I was able to find sort of bigger ones, which is nice. And, uh, yeah, you just shoot a little oil in there. The only tricky part is that I, I'm basically, like, hanging on the <laughs> on the uh, boomkin out there. But I did tie a couple little safety lines in on this last voyage just to, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older or whatever, but it felt a little more secure that way. I don't know. Older and wiser. That's what I'm going to chalk it up to. So Mongo's pretty good. Uh, da, 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 da. I have plenty of the wind blades, and I have one spare hydro blade. It's it's not in the greatest shape because it got a little bit crunched by a boater last year, but having a spare, perfect. So we should be all good with Mongo. And Mongo is really a super essential thing because I don't have any sort of autopilot. I have one of those tiller pilot things. But that only works when you're motoring, and I don't ever sleep when I'm motoring on this boat because the engine's so loud that I don't even want to be down below. Um, no matter how much soundproofing and all that sort of stuff, that just the way the boat is laid out, it you know I I would kill to be able to switch switch the engine out with uh, an electric engine or just a smaller, quieter engine because. The sailing that I do, it just doesn't require much motoring. And if I am motoring, I, I mean, motoring at a thousand RPMs is is really. It's just that we have way too big of an engine, way too big. I'd love to switch it out for a nice little, little yammy or something like that, a little thirty, thirty six horsepower, something like that. Anything that uh, you know, I'd like to be able to do sixteen hundred RPMs and get the boat up to all speed. I think that would be great. But in any event. Um, that brings us on to food, which food, typically food is kind of more of an intensive list, like a subcategory list, because you sort of got to go through all of it. Fortunately, aboard Mighty Sparrow right now, there is just as an estimate, 10 months worth of long life food, mountain house dehydrated meals, um, actual doomsday prepper pails filled with macaroni and cheese, oatmeal, all that sort of stuff. And then up in the shop, I have a huge amount of cans of food, probably another 600 kind bars. There's, there's, I could leave tomorrow, sail around the world and not run out of the food. Um, that is a fact. So, as far as food goes, the only thing I really need to do is uh, come up with a little bit of a grocery list as far as fresh stuff that I want to have on the voyage. And again, that's that's typically just going to be, you know, things to make sandwiches and wraps, uh, lots of eggs. I love eggs, bacon, and um, and maybe a couple of couple of dinner treats i i found this last time i was making cauliflower pizzas like from scratch and it was actually good because cauliflower can stand up to a pretty good beating and uh, still be utilized so i usually will get like maybe three cauliflower and three like i don't know heads of cauliflower i guess that's what they're called um and that allows for three meals that way i'm gonna try and do a little bit of fishing on this trip uh, not too much, but if I can count on maybe one, oh, excuse me, one meal, that would be great. Uh, but other than that, I think I'm going to try and chip away at some of this long life food that I have. Um, I, I did kind of come up with, there's, there's a, a vague idea of, of doing the Pacific Crest Trail next year, uh, next summer. And part of the, the reason I kind of want to do that one is, uh, I could use up a lot of this food, you know, send it along the way. And I don't know, it'd be kind of nice. I'm not expecting that the world will come to an end and I will need to go to my little hiding place in the middle of the South Atlantic with all this food. So, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> but I would love to utilize some of this food. I've had it on this boat for a long time and it's, it's you know, it's decent. It, it I've eaten some of it and yeah, it's not great, but 
if you're out at sea and you're getting used to that sort of food, it tastes pretty good. And then if you're hiking, you could literally eat dirt or cactus needles and it's still good because you're so hungry. So uh, as far as food goes, we could sort of skip most of it. Um, I would say uh, I definitely need to stock the bar because this boat is basically dry at this point. Um, I'm sort of buckled in trying to do the boat projects and continue working on the next book. So I'm, I'm trying to get rid of any, um, any things that, uh, can damper motivation and, uh, things that are big distractions and stuff. So I don't know. I, I, it's mostly just throughout the week and stuff, just trying to just focus, focus, focus. Um, I guess the other thing with food would be coffee, but I have like 20 pounds of coffee on here and plenty of powder creamer. So yeah, food, food is a non-issue on this boat. But again, typically if I were to be starting from scratch, uh, and doing this sort of trip, I would plan for, you know, uh, probably three weeks just to be on the safe side. That would give me a little buffer I wouldn't just say, okay, well, it might be a 10-day trip. That's what I'm expecting. I'm going to get 10 days worth of food. Running out of food or just even having to ration on a boat is a nightmare. You don't want to have to do it if you don't have to. So always just bring more because you can eat it when you get there. And uh, it's not a real big deal. So that's all I have to say about that. (laughs) Uh, Water. Uh, Water is sort of... I have, on Mighty Sparrow, we hold 70 gallons in two separate tanks. Those will obviously be filled. And then I have a five-gallon jerry can that I typically use when I'm trying to catch rain, which I will always do no matter what, no matter how much water I have. I love catching rain because it gives you something to do when it's raining. But I also have a 50-gallon water bladder, and it worked pretty well last time. It did taste a little funny towards the end, uh, but I think that's just because it was new and I probably didn't rinse it out and clean it out enough before I used it. So I've still got it and I'm going to plan on using that again. It fits perfectly once I lower the little um, dining room table, as I like to call it. Uh, I, I don't know if you call it a dinette or whatever, but once you lower the table, it fits perfectly under there and I'm going to actually throw in a couple of hooks that that nail that sucker down nice and tight, maybe a couple nylon straps, but that will allow me, I can't fill it all the way up to 50. I want to say I probably get 40 in there. So conservatively, I'm going to have about 110, 115 gallons of fresh water aboard. Plus I usually like to buy about five gallon jugs and put those in a deep freeze So they're frozen, completely solid, and I'll throw those in the bottom of the fridge to help the cooling process and then just sort of utilize them and drink that water uh, underway. So let's call it 120. So I guess with water, it's just going to be get the five-gallon jugs, uh, and I'll do four of those, four times five-gallon. And I guess in the food category, it's just going to be I'm just going to put grocery shop (laughs) or, you know what? Actually, I'm going to do make list. There we go. And see, even that as, as crazy it might sound, putting on my list, make a list is actually a good thing to do because you, you sort of might get there and be like, Oh God, I never even made a grocery list. Like, uh, (laughs) cause going to the grocery without a list is pretty, uh, risky. Mm. Okay, so that brings us to navigation. And we sort of already hit on this, but obviously I've got the paper charts for the East Coast. I've got a detailed chart book for the coast of Maine all the way from essentially Gloucester, I think, all the way up past Rockland. And it's really detailed. It's the one I've been using for years. It's great. Um, obviously I have the Navex on, on a couple different devices. So that works out pretty well. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot else. I mean, the sextant obviously 
And I have the updated chart books for 2022, or not the chart books, but the uh, Nautical Almanac. So that'll at least let me do my Latin long. Longitude will be sort of the cheater's way, because that's just how I've always done it, and I've been pretty successful with it in the past. I would love to do a podcast about that, but it's got, that would be the most boring. You know, I think the only way I could ever make that interesting is is to sort of copy that um, that drunk history thing, <laughs> do like a a five minute drunk uh, drunk celestial navigation where I try and explain it after uh, a six pack of Bush Light. Who knows? That could be pretty funny. Uh, but it would probably be useless. Other than that, barometer, thermometer, those are all working really well. Spare parts, as far as everything else goes, I mean, there's there's blocks, and I can replace rigging, and I've got all the tools and the power tools. I will have to. Let me uh, check that off real quick. Uh, tools is definitely a list to have, and I want to m- check all batteries because i'll tell you those batteries i i've been using uh I, I bought a big set of ryobi tools and this was years ago and every once in a while those those batteries like to drop right off uh right off the face of the earth as far as how well they hold a charge or if they can even take a charge so i will have to check that out and i do have a spare inverter uh, that I have not used, and then I have a larger inverter that I have used that's, I guess, my second spare, so so those are good. But under tools, I'm going to do check batteries. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. All right. And now I'm going to sit here and think sort of out loud about what else. Oh, you know what? Okay, I need I need a little list for weather because I was having a nightmare of a time downloading. So I have an um, Iridium sat phone that I connect up to my computer to download the weather. And it was giving me just a nightmare of a time. And I think it's because I'm using such an old version of Zgrib on the computer that I think it, because it's a brand new sat phone, and it was working great, but, or it could just be the computer. I'm not too sure, but that has to be, that system needs to be sorted out. So download system. And that, you know, that that's one of those ones where you don't want to be sitting there beating your head against the wall, trying to figure out, or beating your head against the bulkhead out at sea, trying to figure out these computer things when, it's way easier here on land when you have things like YouTube and all that sort of stuff to be able to try and figure out the issues. But I know my computers are getting really old. Both of them have duct tape on them. That's typically the sign that you really need a new computer. Um, but I like to use these things until they're absolutely dead. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you don't want them to die on you when you're out at sea. So there's a balance there, and I haven't quite found it. But that's definitely going on the list is weather, downloads, and sat phone. Uh, and I guess, yeah, I've no, got to throw that on there. Check the sat phone minutes. Sat phone minutes. So that's pretty good. Uh, okay, so just quick recap. Engine and batteries. Okay, we got sales. We got rigging. We got electronics. We got the current projects. We've got self-steering, food. Water, navigation, tools, and weather. So that's a decent start to this list. And I know I'll have to... There's going to be a lot of little bits and bobs that need to be done to sort of... I said the boat's really not full-on dock mode, but obviously there's a bit of a, a metamorphosis that will go on between being on the dock and heading out but that's that sort of stuff that uh i don't even i don't even think you'd have to put it on the list that i need to make my bunk move from the four peak here because i'll have to put all the sails up there so it's not too too crazy um yeah other than that it's really just about 
keeping an eye and and checking this 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 little list off every single day. So I typically will set this on the nav station and when I'm having morning coffee or whatever, I'll sit there and I'll go through it and I'll check off and cross out things or I'll focus on things that I can get done that day. And essentially the goal, and I'm just going to write up in the corner May 1st, even though, yeah, May 1st. So that's the big, that's, that's the goal. And if you can get everything done well before May 1st, even better, because then you've got a little free time, you can relax and do all that. Um, but essentially, one of the things that I try and look out for is that as this list grows and grows, some of these things I'm going to be able to knock off, no problem, first try, it's going to be easy. Other things, I'm going to run into problems, uh, issues, availability, and so they're going to have to be pushed back further and further and further. And so you sort of have to anticipate for that. And that's why I love, love having these lists right in front of me because they just, I don't know, they they sort of give you. And I, I, I will like star some of these things where it's like, oh, yeah, you better check out these sales pretty soon or you better, you know, change the zinc or blah, blah, blah. And and the other one, so I put stars under things that are super important, but the other thing is um, I will put like last week, like a w, uh, LW for last week or, you know, because I'm not going to clean the bottom of the boat now and give it a month for it to grow more of a beard. So when I talk about, you know, cleaning the bottom, that's going to be done the week before I leave, probably the day or, you know, two days before I leave because yeah, I can't imagine finding too much down there, but, um, or too much of an issue that would slow me down. It's one of those things where you just got to grin and bear it and hop in there. Cause they, one of the problems on the rivers down here, uh, in South Carolina is that you've got about, you can see maybe a foot in front of you. And man, when you start digging into that beard, it comes off easy and I got a nice big scraper, but boy, those little shrimps, they come out of nowhere. And when I hop back up, you know, I got, I got sort of squirrel master, a little chest hair thing going on here and covered from navel to nipple, just with these little shrimps. And the longer they're on there, the more they're digging in and eating here. They, I think they just start off eating like the flaky skin or whatever it's coming off of you. But man, oh man, they get they get deep. And they start to they start to bite pretty good. So it's always pretty funny hopping out of there and seeing thousands of little organisms crawling around and just eating your skin. It doesn't really hurt hurt, but it's sort of like get these things off of me now. <laughs> so I usually take a big bottle of shampoo out there on the dock and then just. It's kind of like genocide. <laughs> um, yeah, other than that, uh, I've got some new books. I don't know. That's more on the entertainment side. Yeah, trying to think if there's anything else that I'd, I'd add to this list that uh, would be super, super important. And, and, you know, that's one of those things. Every single day, this needs to be gone over in the morning when you start your day. And then at the end of the day, when you think you're finished with all your projects, maybe having a beer or whatever. That's when you go back to it and uh, take a look because you're always going to add more and more. Right now, this list is one full page with a lot of gaps. I guarantee I'm going to fill all these gaps in and really be uh, really be sort of knocking some of these things off. So, so we shall see. Uh, I did want to here at the end uh, just chat a little bit. I got sort of a, a question about. What are some of the concerns and things you want to watch out for if you're sailing in the Gulf of Maine? And this was uh, from a listener who uh, I've been sort of emailing back and forth with. And I, I did want to mention that for, for anybody that sort of wants to communicate with the show. If you just go to sailingintooblivion.com, which is sort of the, the old website that was for my speaking stuff, and just click on any of the buttons that say, you know, book presentation or contact, and blah, blah, blah. Those emails will go right to me. And uh, I definitely check all those. And I 
will write back and uh, acknowledge uh, that I, I've received it and everything. Um, but yeah, uh, he, uh, I got basically somebody up there in Canada, and he's uh, he wants to uh, do some sailing in the Gulf of Maine. He was wondering sort of what are some of the things to look out for and and things to be ready for. And and the Gulf of Maine, if you're really coastal. One of the things you always got to look out for are lobster pots because they're going to be absolutely everywhere. So depending on the type of boat you have and your rudders and your prop and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, it's hard. I've I've gotten one lobster pot caught around Mongo, and I thought for sure it was going to damage it, but it didn't. Um, I've never had the issue of them getting around the props, but... Lobster pots are uh, prevalent, I'd say, within 20 miles of that coast. And then every once in a while, you'll see the way, way offshore ones. Um, but that's one thing to sort of look out for. And in that same respect are the fishing fleets. Now, I've run into the vast majority of them in and around George's Bank. Um, the, the Great South Channel is pretty random in my experience as far as finding different boats. Uh, you don't get quite. I've never run into the big clusters of fishing boats uh, in that area as opposed to the northeast side of George's Bank. That's where I've always run into the scalloping fleets, and that literally there can be like 50 boats up there. It's crazy, and there's been times where I've peeled right through the middle of them in the fog, in a thunderstorm, freaking out, whales, all this stuff is around me, and it's terrifying, so... Uh, I would any, anytime I'm sailing that route, I always try and I almost always fail at being around George's bank and, and getting past it during daylight. And for whatever reason, I just, I always screw that one up. Uh, but it's always exciting and terrifying and, uh, annoying and it's a sleepless night but hopefully this time it'll it'll go a lot better um so that's something to always look out for it's it's a pretty active fishing ground it's one of the uh it's one of the best fishing grounds in the world i think um so that's something you definitely have to look out for other than that i think some of the the biggest concerns especially if say say you were going from from somewhere in maine or up in Canada and then heading down to like Boston or Gloucester. So you're crossing the Gulf of Maine sort of offshore. You just have to be sort of ready for thick, thick fog. I mean, it's it's going to hit you at some point. So take that into consideration as far as your navigation. You know, whether you're going to do... I, I would think every boat is going to want to have AIS because it's so, so good. It just leaves all the calculations out of it and it just tells you what boats are around and if you're going to hit them and if not, how close they are. Or, you know, you could go old school, have the radar that helps all, you know, have both if you want. Um, but, um, yeah, you, you definitely have to have to envision for a second that you are not going to be able to see anything either day or night because of the fog. So you always have to watch out for that. And then, um, your weather reports, because you can trying to think, I'm pretty sure if I was doing the Great South Channel and heading into the Gulf of Maine, I think I was always able to get a VHF weather forecast. Right, now, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure from the Great South Channel, straight up, you could get it. Now, I do also know on the northeast side of George's. I don't think I could get the VHF, but there's enough fishing boats around that chances are one of the guys, one of the captains will will answer you back if you're looking for a bit of a forecast. I can't guarantee that either because they're busy and they're doing their thing, but that's another uh I think if you if you called somebody looking for a weather forecast, they'd they'd probably get back to you knowing that that area is sort of prone for pretty bad weather. I can't really think of too much else. Um, you know, having, having some really good detailed navigation stuff as far as the apps and stuff like that, make it super easy getting in and out of all the crazy ports because there's lots of rocks and, uh, you know, knowing your tides is going to be huge for when you're getting into the coastal stuff. Uh, 
let alone just being in the Gulf of Maine. I mean, geez, even around Georgia's, holy cow, some of those currents just rip. You can go from being just doing eight knots over the ground to all of a sudden doing one knot and you're just, you hit it at the wrong time and the tide is going against you and you just sort of wait it out. Um, so being pretty up on tides, having all the navigation aids that you can have on the boat, making sure that you're ready and prepared to be in heavy fog for a long time. Um, and yeah, keeping an eye out for fishing vessels and fishing gear. Those are probably my three biggest concerns when, when approaching, uh, the Gulf of Maine from, from the ocean or from, from Rockland, really, um, Rockland, you're already in it, you know, in the thick of it. So you got to just sort of deal with it. But I don't know. The Gulf of Maine's pretty cool. I've, I've been becalmed in it. I've been blown around in it. And, uh, I've never been like a heavy storm knock on wood in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, I've, I've passed by George's bank in some pretty ugly weather, but nothing terrible. So, you know, my, my old man, he, he sailed it a lot and back in the day. And he, he always laughs cause he, you know, they would do it in the summertime and it was like a mill pond. They, they ended up motoring half the time. So I don't know. So, uh, other than that, that's, that's pretty much my thoughts on the old Gulf of Maine. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back up there. It should be pretty nice. Uh, see some, see some old friends up there, get to work and earn a little money see what's going on uh just a little change of pace you know i get those itchy feet like yeah even though i just got back to sparrow which is really enjoyable be able to sort of do these projects and get the boat back in shape i am i'm really looking forward to getting that bowsprit back on i know it's going to be another two weeks but the boat looks so funny without it it just i don't even recognize it so ideally I'm going to do it, get it done, have a good week down here where I can just sort of kick back, relax, uh, enjoy dock life uh, before heading out to sea and then heading back up to Maine and working my butt off. So other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I got a few more coming up and uh, there will be sort of interviews and then some uh, different stuff too, uh, completely off the sailing subject because I want to I want to dabble in that as well. But uh, thanks for listening, and thanks for all those guys that are out there supporting the uh, the podcast uh, through Patreon. I really appreciate it, and that is absolutely what is keeping this show going. Good night. Okay, wow. Uh, just as I was about to post this podcast, I realized we neglected, or I, sorry, <laughs> neglected, probably one of the most important aspects of any sailing voyage and that would be safety life-saving equipment wow leave it to jerome the guy who doesn't wear a life jacket to uh <laughs> to, to forget all that sort of stuff so i am putting that down and uh life-saving equipment yes very very uh very important aspect. So uh, <laughs> I can't believe I forgot that. But I'll tell you what, I'm glad I remembered it because, boy, <sighs> I guess I just take it for granted that I, I have this boat equipped uh, for full offshore solo mode. And I don't know. I just I, I know it's all there, uh, but it's something that definitely needs to be talked about. So I have a new up-to-date four-man life raft. It is offshore, or I should say four-person life raft, and it is offshore capable. It does not have food or water in it, so the grab bag is essential. I actually went through the grab bag yesterday, and I have all up-to-date flares, sound signal, first aid kits, spare food, and uh, that's typically what I keep the five-gallon jerry can of water for. I typically won't touch that uh, unless I absolutely need it. Plus, I always keep the little handheld water maker that stays on board uh, or it stays in the grab bag as well. I, on board, I have three uh, fire extinguishers, which are all up-to-date and working, the e is in the grab bag as well. That, I will have to check the battery, so I'm going to write that down. e da, da, da. Battery test. 
Okay. And inside of that, I typically will like to, uh, I keep a GPS in there. I don't keep the sat phone in there because that stays in the Pelican case. But the Pelican case is is kind of like a secondary grab bag because that, that keeps all the electronics, the computers, and uh, hard drives and things like that. So ideally, if uh, the boat is sinking, life raft gets deployed, grab bag, Pelican case, and the five-gallon jerry can all go into the cockpit with me. Uh, I don't know how realistic that plan is, but I do have two life jackets aboard. One of them's an old-school little square orange jobby, uh, and then the other one is one of the inflatable ones where I actually have taken the CO2 cartridge out of, and I just self-inflate it. That's a personal choice of mine, just because I have not only experienced, but I've seen when uh, people actually inflate those, and then they explode because the CO2 is a little too much for the age of the life jacket, I guess. Uh, Other than that, safety equipment-wise, I have all the stuff to run jack, jack lines aft and forward, uh, on the boat if needed, if heavy weather is coming. And I have a couple of tethers that I can use to lock myself into the cockpit or moving forward if needed, if I deem it necessary. Other than that, you know, the foul weather gear and stuff like that, that's all on board as well. I have a life ring, but I really just use that for the coastal part in case I get pulled over by the Coast Guard. And then I stow that down below because I can't throw it to anybody and no one can throw it to me once I'm out at sea because I'm alone. If you have crew with you, obviously you're going to uh, utilize something like that a whole lot more. And that pretty much is my safety equipment on this boat. Besides the number one safety thing, which is your brain and making the right choices and uh, not fooling around and, uh, you know, really thinking through all the moves and always making sure that you are holding on for dear life whenever you're moving around this boat, because if you fall overboard, the boat will sail away. Now that I've covered my base is there. Sorry about that. I had just added another five minutes to the podcast, but uh, hey, it's worth talking about because if you're not going to be safe out there, you shouldn't go. So have a good night. Thanks for listening.